Racism is the lowest, most crudely primitive form of collectivism. It is the notion of ascribing moral, social, or political significance to a man's genetic lineage. The notion that a man's intellectual and characterological traits are produced and transmitted by his internal body chemistry, which means in practice that a man is to be judged not by his own character and actions, but by the characters and actions of a collective of ancestors. Racism claims that the content of a man's mind, not his cognitive apparatus, but its content, is inherited. That a man's convictions, values, and character are determined before he is born by physical factors beyond his control. This is the caveman's version of the doctrine of innate ideas or of inherited knowledge, which has been thoroughly refuted by philosophy and science. Racism is a doctrine of, by, and for brutes. It is a barnyard or stock farm version of collectivism, appropriate to a mentality that differentiates between various breeds of animals, but not between animals and men. Like every form of determinism, racism invalidates the specific attribute which distinguishes man from all other living species: his rational faculty. Racism negates two aspects of man's life. Reason and choice, or mind and morality, replacing them with chemical predestination. The respectable family that supports worthless relatives or covers up their crimes in order to protect the family name, as if the moral stature of one man could be damaged by the actions of another. The bum who boasts that his great grandfather was an empire builder, or the small town spinster who boasts that her maternal great uncle was a state senator and her third cousin gave a concert at Carnegie Hall, as if the achievements of one man could rub off on the mediocrity of another. The parents who search genealogical trees in order to evaluate their prospective sons-in-law, the celebrity who starts his autobiography with a detailed account of his family history, all these are samples of racism. The atavistic manifestations of a doctrine whose full expression is the tribal warfare of prehistorical savages, the theory that holds good blood or bad blood as a moral intellectual criterion, can lead to nothing but torrents of blood in practice. Brute force is the only avenue of action open to men who regard themselves as mindless aggregates of chemicals. Just as there is no such thing as a collective or racial mind, so there is no such thing as a collective or racial achievement. There are only individual minds and individual achievements, and a culture is not the anonymous product of undifferentiated masses, but the sum of the intellectual achievements of individual men. Even if it were proved, which it is not. That the incidence of men of potentially superior brain power is greater among the members of certain races than among the members of others, it would still tell us nothing about any given individual, and it would be irrelevant to one's judgment of him. A genius is a genius, regardless of the number of morons who belong to the same race, and a moron is a moron, regardless of the number of geniuses who share his racial origin. The question of whether one alleges the superiority or the inferiority of any given race is irrelevant. Racism has only one psychological root: the racist's sense of his own inferiority. Like every other form of collectivism, racism is a quest for the unearned. It is a quest for automatic knowledge, for an automatic evaluation of men's characters that bypasses the responsibility of exercising rational or moral judgment. And above all, a quest for an automatic self-esteem or pseudo self-esteem. To ascribe one's virtues to one's racial origin is to confess that one has no knowledge of the process by which virtues are acquired, and most often that one has failed to acquire them. The overwhelming majority of racists are men who have earned no sense of personal identity, who can claim no individual achievement or distinction. And who seek the illusion of a tribal self-esteem by alleging the inferiority of some other tribe? Observe that racism is much more prevalent among the poor white trash than among their intellectual betters. Historically, racism has always risen or fallen with the rise or fall of collectivism. Collectivism holds that the individual has no rights; that his life and work belong to the group, to society, to the tribe, the state, the nation.
and that the group may sacrifice him at its own whim to its own interests. The simplest collective to join, the easiest one to identify, particularly for people of limited intelligence, the least demanding form of belonging and of togetherness is race. The only way to implement a doctrine of that kind is by means of brute force, and statism has always been the political corollary of collectivism. The absolute state is merely an institutionalized form of gang rule, regardless of which particular gang seizes power. There is only one antidote to racism, the philosophy of individualism and its politico-economic corollary, laissez-faire capitalism. Individualism regards man, every man, as an independent, sovereign entity who possesses an inalienable right to his own life a right derived from his nature as a rational being. Individualism holds that a civilized society or any form of association, cooperation, or peaceful coexistence among men can be achieved only on the basis of the recognition of individual rights, and that a group as such has no rights other than the individual rights of its members. It is not a man's ancestors or relatives or genes or body chemistry that count in a free market but only one human attribute, productive ability. It is by his own individual ability and ambition that capitalism judges a man and rewards him accordingly. No political system can establish universal rationality by law or by force, but capitalism is the only system that functions in a way which rewards rationality and penalizes all forms of irrationality, including racism. A fully free capitalist system has not yet existed anywhere. But what is enormously significant is the correlation of racism and political controls in the semi-free economies of the 19th century. Racial and or religious persecutions of minorities stood in inverse ratio to the degree of a country's freedom. Racism was strongest in the more controlled economies such as Russia and Germany, and weakest in England, the then freest country of Europe. It is capitalism that gave mankind its first steps toward freedom and a rational way of life. It is capitalism that broke through national and racial barriers by means of free trade. It is capitalism that abolished serfdom and slavery in all the civilized countries of the world. In its great era of capitalism, the United States was the freest country on earth and the best refutation of racist theories. Men of all races came here, some from obscure, culturally undistinguished countries, and accomplished feats of productive ability that would have remained stillborn in their control-ridden native lands. America had been called the melting pot with good reason, but few people realized that America did not melt men into the gray conformity of a collective, she united them by means of protecting their right to individuality. Racism is an evil, irrational, and morally contemptible doctrine, but doctrines cannot be forbidden or prescribed by law. Just as we have to protect a communist's freedom of speech, even though his doctrines are evil, so we have to protect a racist's right to the use and disposal of his own property. Private racism is not a legal but a moral issue and can be fought only by private means, such as economic boycott or social ostracism. In conclusion, I shall quote from an astonishing editorial in the New York Times, astonishing because ideas of this nature are not typical of our age. Quote, But the question must not be whether a group recognizable in color, features, or culture has its rights as a group. No, the question is whether any American individual, regardless of color, features, or culture, is deprived of his rights as an American. If the individual has all the rights and privileges due him under the laws and the Constitution, we need not worry about groups and masses. Those do not, in fact, exist, except as figures of speech.